growth increased our possibilities. Now, I come from a very small family. My father was an orphan, so I never knew his parents. My mother was the second of three daughters. She grew up on a dairy farm. Her family raised corn, fed the corn to cows, and sold the cow's milk uh, in Kansas, such a small state in the middle of North America. My parents married very young. They took jobs immediately after graduating from high school so that they could earn money to start their family and acquire a home. I was born first, and my sister, uh, actually I was born when my mother was not even uh, 20 years old, and my sister arrived soon after. I'm the one in the middle. No one in my parents' family had studied past high school. Therefore, it did not occur to my parents to do so. I believe I'm still the only person in my entire family which studied past the first four years of college. Despite their formal education, my parents had an enormous influence on my life and on my career. They were intelligent, practical, honest, loving people. And from them, I acquired seven habits of thought that have influenced my entire scientific career. My parents taught me to live within ethical limits. The first lesson is that you should be optimistic. You should expect that life gradually will get better, believe that people are generally good, and that things generally work out the way they were intended. Nothing will be given to you for free, but you should expect that honest and dedicated work will let you achieve your goals. The second lesson, when your goals are not realized through hard work, don't accept failure as your fate. Probably your frustration results because something is wrong or broken. There must be a mistake or a problem someplace. So third, third lesson, when there is a mistake or a problem, expect that some systematic search will let you locate it and diagnose it, that you can find out what is wrong and why. Number four, after you know what's wrong, expect that it can be fixed. Probably you can fix it by yourself, and certainly you should try to do that. These ideas seem very obvious and mundane, but remember that many people go through life blaming their frustrations and their misfortunes on karma, fate, bad luck, divine will, or malefactors. They consider that something or someone outside their power or beyond their comprehension is responsible for their difficulties. When you accept failure, you don't become a good scientist. With those four lessons, my parents gave me the, whole, the valuable view that I am at least partially responsible for the problems I encounter. I learned from them that when I have problems, it is not correct and not useful simply to blame someone or something else. I need to take personal responsibility, acknowledge my mistakes, learn from my errors, change my actions, work harder. And while doing that, I remember my parents' fifth lesson. Always be honest to yourself and others. My mother and father died 10 years ago, but I still have in my office a sign that hung on the wall of our family home. It says, you better not compromise yourself. It's all you've got. In other words, always be honest. The liar hurts himself more than he hurts others. Obviously, this is not a new idea. For example, you have in Japan a proverb that approximately expresses this lesson. You say, sow evil, reap evil. We have the same proverb in English, you reap what you sow. Though my parents were somewhat idealistic, they were also very practical. They knew that no one can solve all problems and, within, and win all gambles. So they taught me two more important lessons. 
conserve your time and husband your resources. Lesson number six came from my mother. Her slogan was, if there's an answer, try and find it. If there is not, never mind it. Don't waste your time on problems where you have no possibility to achieve a useful result. And that was matched by lesson number seven. If you can't afford to lose, don't gamble. It's better to give up a chance for large gain rather than put yourself in a situation where losing would be catastrophic. My parents applied those lessons every day to their family, their home, their work, their community, raising their children, maintaining their house, performing their jobs, and dealing with friends. But those seven lessons also apply on a much larger scale. Over the past 40 years, those lessons have guided my research on the mistakes and problems that seem to be pushing human society ever faster towards its own demise. My parents addressed problems around their home. I've spent many my life addressing problems around the globe. Unfortunately, the world is facing many profound problems. Industrialized countries are producing more and more greenhouse gases, even as the weather is careening toward conditions that will be hostile to human life. The rich nations are using more and more fossil energy, even as those fuels are becoming more expensive and less plentiful. Non-renewable resources are being depleted, and renewable resources are being destroyed so that future generations will be denied their use. Plant, animal, and insect species are being exterminated. Groundwater is being pumped out in volumes far beyond its capacity for recharge. And agricultural soils are being converted to wastelands. The gap between the rich and the poor is increasing explosively today. Last year, for example, the richest 500 people in the world had a combined income greater than the poorest 400 million. Drawing on the lessons from my parents, I have automatically assumed that we should expect the world will work better than it is working today. I assume that the reasons for the various failures can be discovered and that I could and I should help to fix them. Looking for solutions to global problems has been the focus of my life's work. Of course, I did not start with an interest in global problems. I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, a relatively prosperous town in the center of the American continent. In Rochester, most people do not look far ahead or far afield. School, sport, fun, these were the main areas of interest for me and my friends in Rochester. It's a very young city. It was built up on land that was given over to the white man by the Native American Indians with a treaty signed in 1853, the same year that Commodore Perry sailed into Tokyo Bay. When I was a boy, the oldest structure in our town was a log cabin built in the 1850s. Growing up in Rochester obviously did not challenge me to understand history. The challenge came during my first trip to Europe in 1959 when I was 17 years old. I went as an American field service exchange student to Switzerland, and there I lived for the summer with a local family and began my lifelong study of the German language. Like most Americans, I had thought that the important human history really started in 1492, when Christopher Columbus discovered America, or in the year 1783, when the American colonies finally won their war of independence from England. How ignorant I was. When our country finally won the American Revolution against England, Emperor Jimu's reign over this island nation was already 2,400 years in the past. Constantinople was consecrated by the Romans in the year 330, conquered by the Turks over a millennium later. And that conquest occurred 400 years before my town was incorporated. But I was uninformed about all that. I was uh, like the frog in your proverb.
in English, we would translate this, people are satisfied to judge things by their own narrow experience, never knowing the wide world outside. Therefore, it had a profound impact on me when that first trip to Europe took me to a region where people spoke different languages and traced their origins far back before the time of the Romans. That trip gave me new limits within which to view the problems the potentials of human society. I learned to shift my sights from just decades to millennia. I saw that there had been many ways for people to organize their economy and society. Unrestricted free markets and representational democracy may work very well for some cultures, but they're not the best systems for all people, nor the end point of cultural evolution. I learned that civilizations not only grow, they also inevitably decline. However, the most important perspective I gained during that summer in Europe was certainly about my future career. I decided that I wanted to spend my life discovering new ideas and teaching them to others. I still remember explaining to someone on the ship coming back to the United States at the end of that 1959 summer, I said, if you count your wealth in material goods, then sharing with others makes you poorer. But if you count your wealth in wisdom, then sharing with others makes you richer. So I resolved to become a scientist and a professor, to discover new ideas and convey them to others. And along with that resolution came my first perception that I would need to continue my studies for many years past high school. Fortunately, my parents offered moral and financial support for those studies. In 1960, I entered Carleton College, a small liberal arts school in Minnesota with excellent professors. There, I majored in chemistry. Eventually, my studies qualified me for an internship as a junior chemist at Argonne National Laboratory, one of the national research centers managed by the United States Atomic Energy Commission. My summer at Argonne convinced me that I loved the challenge of research, but definitely did not want to spend the rest of my life mixing chemical compounds. I decided to find an area of research that offered me more contact with people and less contact with radioactivity. I had always enjoyed business. Already in high school, I created my first company and helped fund my college studies by selling newspapers. I know little about my father's father, uh, my grandfather, since he died long before I was born. But I do know that he was a merchant. He owned and operated a little store in the small town of Junction City, Kansas. Probably I inherited some of my grandfather's entrepreneurial spirit. When, for that reason or some other, during my final year at Carleton, I discovered I had a special interest in management science. The business school at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology had recently hired an electrical engineering professor, Jay Forrester. He was building up a team to design new computer-based methods for understanding complex social and economic systems. When I learned about Forrester Center, it seemed to be a perfect fit for my interests. In 1964, I entered the Industrial Dynamics doctoral program at MIT's Sloan School of Management. The school's curriculum used my quantitative skills and offered me powerful and innovative new tools. With them, I advanced my understanding of social and economic systems. During five years, 1964 to 1969, I earned my PhD while gradually taking on more and more teaching responsibilities. When I had completed my studies, MIT offered me a position on their faculty. During my time as a student at MIT, I remembered the enormous new insights that I had received from that first trip to Europe, and I resolved to do something even better. With three friends, I planned a year-long overland trip, driving two Land Rover automobiles from the United Kingdom to Sri Lanka and back, 100,000 kilometers during a period of 12 months. That journey in 1969 and 70 took us back and forth across 12 nations. We camped in deserts, climbed up mountains, kayaked down rivers, recorded music in temples, and explored the archeological remains 
of ancient cities. We coped with many alphabets, respected many religions, and made friends in dozens of different cultures. The trip impressed me with the enormous diversity of the human species. It also showed me humanity's enormous capacity for folly. Our travels took me through many devastated landscapes where one still sees the lasting damage caused by past civilizations, overpopulation, plunder, and greed. For example, in the Iranian wilderness, I saw stone carved pictures of wildlife that had lived in the region before it was converted from desert by overexploitation and war. In Afghanistan mountains near Bamiyan, I saw sites where archaeologists have dug up remains from several dozen different civilizations. I suppose that the leaders of each of those civilizations in turn imagined that it would be the last to rule over that region. But none of them endured. Since my time in Afghanistan in 1969 and 70, two more powers have come and gone. Both the Soviets and the Taliban have tried to impose their will. Both were eventually defeated. And now, of course, NATO powers are fighting there, assuming they can prevail where so many other people have failed. After that trip, I came back at MIT in June of 1970, precisely on the day that we learned the Club of Rome Executive Committee would soon visit our laboratory to learn more about our mathematical modeling methods. They wished to determine whether our computer simulations might be used to produce new insights about the global concerns to them. After we had worked with the club's committee members for a week, including, of course, uh, Soburo Okita from Japan, they decided to fund a project with our group. My trip through Asia and Europe had given me a desire to understand longer-term social dynamics. The systems methods I had learned at MIT gave me the tools to do that. And suddenly, the Club of Rome was offering the possibility of money and a client. I proposed to the club executive committee that I would conduct a two-year project for them on the causes and consequences of physical growth on the planet. They accepted my offer to elaborate on a simple teaching model that had been developed by Jay Forrester. My wife at that time, Donella Meadows, abandoned her career as a biophysicist at Harvard to join our effort and I assembled a team of 15 others to carry out the work. We worked for almost two years, from summer of 1970 through the summer of 1972. I was a senior scientist and director of the effort to construct and analyze World 3, a computer simulation model built for the club. Our results were reported in three books. The first of them was Limits to Growth. Before long, we would write that report, we confronted our first difficulty, learning to conduct research within the limits of available data. In the early 1970s, most information relating to causes and consequences of physical growth on the planet were expressed in financial terms. Unfortunately, data on price, gross domestic product, and other economic variables are inadequate indicators of long-term physical reality, since they are easily and frequently influenced by short-term changes and by political considerations. The current economic crisis illustrates that point. For example, in the United States today, a house that sold last year for $500,000 may be purchased for $200,000. The phenomenal reduction in price does not reflect any change in the physical character of the house. It simply shows the effects of economic cycles. A barrel of oil was $160 last year. Now it's $50. Does that mean that oil is physically more abundant today? Of course not. It simply shows the effects of economic cycles. Not all indicators are so ambiguous as price. For example, physical units of measure are relatively constant. For example, a kilogram of meat sold in Paris in the time of Napoleon weighs precisely the same as a kilogram of meat sold today in Tokyo. 
Economists like to imagine that they are dealing with immutable measures like kilograms, but financial units of measure are incredibly ambiguous. A dollar in colonial America, for example, had an entirely different value and meaning than a dollar today. Rising inflation, advancing technology, changing definitions, evolving consumption patterns, cultural transformation, shifting exchange rates, all make it impossible to understand fully the important century-long patterns of change in physical reality by looking only at long-term financial time series. That was our big difficulty. Compounding the difficulty is the fact that most modern economists, with their enormous faith in markets, have assumed away many of the issues that were of interest to us in the development of our model. For example, they have asserted that resource depletion and environmental pollution are largely irrelevant. They assert that the trends in the market prices for resources give us much more information about future scarcity than a detailed analysis of geological and technical factors. They've largely reduced the profoundly complex moral issues involved in reducing pollution to simple debates about appropriate rates of discounting. To overcome these problems of my team, we were often forced to read through the writings of analysts from an earlier period before the ideology of the free market became so dominant. Unlike economics, the physical sciences do steadily advance. Therefore, the writings of alchemists, for example, don't give us much insight about modern material science. But social and political systems develop through cycles. The writings of social philosophers from long ago can give valuable insights into the problems we face today. We had to search long and hard for information that revealed real changes in the globe productivity and carrying capacity. We had to talk to experts whose intuitive experience often contained more wisdom than their published papers. And we had to search through archives for data that was often considered too unimportant to publish. But finally, we did manage to find theories and data that permitted us to create a useful computer model. This diagram was published in our 1972 book. It shows world three, our model of interactions among six major variables, population, industrial and service capital, food, non-renewable resources, and long life pollution. We had to decide which equations to put in the model and how best to design and quantify them. After we had begun to develop useful insights from our research, we confronted a second difficulty. We had to find ways to communicate new insights about limits to growth in ways that would cause policymakers to change their behavior. I encountered that difficulty already in our first presentation, a report organized by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. On March 2, 1972, a little over 37 years ago, I presented the first public summary of our results before a large group of politicians, journalists, scientists, and economists. My speech was naively based on the belief that a straightforward report of our research would convince leaders to make the necessary behavior change. I never imagined it would be controversial to point out that physical growth cannot continue forever on a finite planet. Nevertheless, our conclusions ignited an explosion of articles, books, conferences, and studies. The response ranged from outraged criticism to fervent support. There's no need and no time to repeat here the details of our analysis, but I will summarize briefly what we said 37 years ago. Unfortunately, it's still true. But before I go into the details of our finding, uh, I would just wish to say that the title of our book was poorly chosen. We did talk about limits in our report. Limits on the amount of low entropy resources available. Limits on the capacity of the planet to grow food and produce industrial goods. Limits of natural ecosystems to assimilate pollution. One chapter in the Limits to Growth was devoted to a summary of data that illustrate these points. However, we did not prove that there are limits. If you believe that technological ingenuity can overcome any obstacle, 
if you think that the market will always provide lower cost substitutes for the goods that grow scarce, or if you believe that some divine power will intercede at the last moment to save humanity from the negative consequences of its folly, our work will not bring you to accept that there are effective limits to growth. On the other hand, if you share our belief that it's impossible to have infinite physical growth on a physically finite planet, then our analyses offer you important new insights. We showed through our computer simulation model three things. First, the planet's limits are erodible. If we abuse the global system, its carrying capacity will decline. Two, there are very, very long delays throughout the structure of the social, political, biological, geological, technological, and other mechanisms that govern population and economic growth on this planet. Erodibility combined with delays in the adaptive systems logically imply that growth will end through overshoot and collapse unless there are drastic increases in society's time horizon and revisions in its goals and ethics. Our findings were in some ways analogous to Isaac Newton's three laws of motion. Newton's principles do not predict precisely what future behavior an object will have, but they state that many conceivable behavior patterns are impossible. Similarly, we did not predict precisely what future behavior the global system will have, but we did state that physical growth cannot continue forever, and we concluded that overshoot and decline would result unless there were major changes in policy. The World 3 standard scenario illustrates that point. This growth graph shows global average values calculated by the computer year by year for five important aggregate world factors. Population, amount of unused non-renewable resources, resources, population, amount of persistent pollution, total annual food production from 1900 up to 2100. So we are just now in this period. Notice two features of the curve that are shown here. First, in the early years, each of the factors grows exponentially. Even in 1972, we expected growth would continue until about 2010 or 2020. Second, its growth slows until each factor reaches some maximum value, usually within the first few decades of this particular century, and then declines to much lower values. The important contribution of this these curves is not the suggestion that all physical factors must eventually quit expanding on a finite planet. The important contribution are our conclusions that this will happen rather soon, within the lifetime of people in this audience, and that the behavior after the peak is most likely going to be a long period of decline, not a high level of equilibrium. Our simulations demonstrated that eliminating one limit to growth does not permit the system to expand forever. It merely forces other limits to become more powerful until their combined effect is sufficient to offset the forces that are trying to sustain growth in the system. There's an unspoken, unspoken belief that the most difficult time for society represented in our model would be after the peak in this period where the curves are going down. That will be difficult, but the worst time will be before the peak in this period. As the pressures rapidly mount to slow growth, we're entering that period now. It's totally false to take these curves as a literal prediction of the future. We never do that. But there is no support in our scenarios for anticipating the end of our species. Our reference run calculates that in the year 2100, out here, there will be more people, more food, more industrial production than there were in the year 1900, significantly more. 
A common response to this scenario is to suggest that technological advance will make it possible to grow forever. Japan has shown how fast technology can advance and change society. When Admiral Perry sailed into Tokyo Bay 150 years ago, Japan performed most of its work by hand. Your country was based on agriculture, and it was essentially sealed to the outside world. Now, 150 years later, Japan is a leader in many important areas of robotic production. It's based on industry, and its economy is linked to every nation of the world. In the Edo period, peasants were 80% of the population. Now, advanced farming methods permit agriculture to employ a very small fraction of your citizens. So when you look at your own history, you may ask whether technological advance has the potential for changing our forecasts. The answer is no. Technological advance alone does not eliminate any of the three reasons that predispose global society to overshoot or to collapse. It is urgently important to develop many new technologies, but they will only give us the time required for altering the important factors, desired family size, consumption goals, concern for equity, respect for nature. These ideas seem obvious, but if you examine most political programs today, and most pronouncements by mainstream economists, you'll find a very different view. They essentially argue that growth will solve all our problems, and that if we solve the short-term problems, the long-term problems will take care of themselves. A reason for this difference between the mandates of our research and actions of national leaders emerges from considering the differences between easy and difficult problems. The difference between these two are illustrated by four simple pictures I'll show you. The first shows the essential nature of a problem. In this discussion, I'll say that a problem is a difference between some factor, actual value, and its desired value. Here, up is better. So when the desired value is high, you have a problem. Or in other words, a problem exists when we, what we have is different from what we want. This slide uh, illustrates that problem. Next evaluation is the next time when we will review the actions that we take. This could be the next time you finish a foot race. If your problem is to raise running speed, it could be the next election. If your problem is to increase the number of citizens who vote for you, it could be the next time you take an academic test or stand on a scale to determine your body weight or get reviewed for promotion or gauge the affection of someone you love or decide how happy you are. Now, assume that there are two, prob two actions which we could imagine to take to move us from where we are now to where we want to be. Action one and action two. In an easy problem, the action that will finally solve the problem, take you from where you are to where you want to be, also gives us a better output at the next evaluation. And action two, which could make the problem worse in the future, also makes it look worse at the point of next evaluation. With easy problems like this, there's usually no argument about what to do. Action one is clearly better, and in fact, most economic and political systems will pick it. But sometimes the situation is different. I call those difficult problems. Here, the action that will finally solve the problem makes things look worse at the point of next evaluation. And the action which makes things look better soon makes them much worse later. Now the choice isn't so obvious. Those who only care about the apparent health of the system at the point of next evaluation, for example, politicians who just want to win the next election, they will argue for action one. And those who seek an enduring solution will argue for action two. 
The distinction between easy and difficult problems is important because most of the global problems that threaten our species today are difficult problems in the sense of the word. Yet politicians and markets choose solutions as if they were easy problems. For example, to make energy relatively more available and cheaper in the distant future requires that we take now actions that will make it more scarce and more expensive in the near future. Such restrictive measures are required to stimulate the efficiencies and substitutions that are required to reduce our addiction to fossil fuels. But instead, the politically popular approach is to, to rising energy prices is to provide stimulus that will increase fossil fuel production and offer subsidies that lower its market price. Slowing climate change, reducing poverty, halting soil erosion, slowing destruction of renewable resources, and other global challenges all require that we take measures that will make the situation seem to many people much worse in the short term. We will be able to make these changes, but it will require that we find ways to convert difficult problems into simple ones. That requires three changes. First, policymakers need to have a more sophisticated understanding about the behavior of complex systems. They need to realize that the short-term and the long-term response of a complex system to some action may be in opposite directions. Just because an action makes a situation seem better immediately doesn't mean that the problem has been solved. Just because a policy causes distress in the short term does not mean it will ultimately fail to solve the problem. The second change required, we need to develop forecasts that show the future consequences of current actions. We need a sort of social radar system. If a ship captain were to steer his boat only to avoid obstacles immediately in front of the vessel, he would eventually have a collision because it takes many minutes and many miles to change the direction of a moving ship. Our economy is like a ship. The captain needs to take action now in anticipation of obstacles that lay, lie far ahead. And information for doing that is provided to him by a radar. Our global model, World 3, is a primitive social radar. It shows the possible future consequences, 10, 20, 30 years into the future, of actions that we take now. And the third change, we need to increase the time horizon the interval of time within which costs and benefits of current actions are compared. We need to push further into the future the point of next evaluation, giving the better policy more time to demonstrate its effects. Obviously, most societies still lack the requirements for solving difficult problems. They adopt policies mainly because they look better in the short term, and therefore global problems are generally tending to get worse. <clears throat> I'm often asked how I'm able to sustain my enthusiasm for dealing with these global problems for almost four decades, even though most of the problems just seem to be going more and more severe. In the last few minutes of my remarks today, I'll share with you a partial answer. The same ideas that led me to focus on global issues long ago have also given me a basis for hope and I've learned to live with the limits of what I can achieve. No one can solve all these problems totally, but all of us can make them slightly better. It's important to realize that global problems, such as population growth beyond a region's carrying capacity, nuclear proliferation, depletion of resources, poverty in the midst of wealth, climate change, and other afflictions, are not imposed on us by divine will or by forces outside our understanding. Those global problems arise from the action of the planet's people, now about 6.8 billion, who get up every morning, go about their daily lives, and go back to bed at night. Those people have habits, habits of consumption, habits of energy and water use, habits of waste disposal, habits that govern the way they live, transport their materials, cook their food, choose their family size. For centuries, those habits were largely useful. They helped many people grow richer and secure better lives. 
Now those habits threaten to make the life much worse for all of us. Those habits need to be changed. And there is an underlying desire to make the necessary changes because no one really wants the climate to become destructive. No one really wants for billions of people to live in poverty. No one really wants for resource depletion to derail industrial development. But how can we change those habits? To illustrate the idea about habit change, I'm going to conduct a very brief exercise with all of you. You'll see that the lessons from this exercise are important, so I ask you, please listen to my instructions and do as I say. So, please, cross your arms. Thank you. Now, look down and notice which wrist is on top. Remember whether it's your left or your right. Good. Drop your arms. Now, please cross your arms. And once again, look down and see which wrist is on top. OK. Now you can drop your arms again. Now I'm going to conduct a quick study. Everyone who had the same wrist up on top both times, please raise your hand. So I, I did too. Almost everybody. Of course, it is possible to cross your arms two different ways either with the left wrist on top or with the right wrist on top. But what we find, like we found here, most people cross their arms the same way every time, just as you did. You get a habit, it works, and then you use it. Now let's just see. Everyone who had the right wrist on top, raise your hand. Thank you. Everyone who had the left wrist on top, raise your hand. Uh, so it's about half one way, half the other way. Usually it's about equal. Half the people develop the habit one way, and half develop the other way. It works either way. Once you find a way that works, it's efficient to keep using that way. I mean, it would be really stupid. Every time you want to do something with your arms, you have to sit there and figure out, how am I going to cross my arm? No, you have a habit, then you use it. But sometimes habits are no longer useful, and you have to change. So now I ask you, everyone cross your arms the other way. Congratulations, you did it. <laughs> but you noticed something. First, it is possible. You can change your habits. Number two, you have to think about it. It's not easy at first. Probably you might make some mistakes. You have to observe until you establish a new pattern. And three, it's not very comfortable. When you change your habit and have a new habit, and at first, it's uncomfortable. Over the next several decades, the world's people are going to have to change their habits. And they will have exactly the same three factors. They will be able to do it, but they're going to have to think about it. It's going to involve errors. They're going to have to be willing to learn from their errors and experiment. And it won't be comfortable at first. Politicians hope we can move to sustainability in a way which is comfortable for everybody. It's a fantasy. For example, we need a new transportation system based on vehicles that use electricity from renewable energy sources. The oil industry and traditional car manufacturers will be extremely unhappy about this change. 
But we will make the change because we have to. Our survival depends on it. We need a new agricultural system based on techniques that regenerate soil fertility, eliminate toxic chemicals, employ more labor, and economize on the use of water. The ministries of agriculture in many nations and industries in the agro-industrial complex will be extremely unhappy about the change. But we will make it because our survival depends on it. We need a cultural system that defines happiness as having enough, not a cultural system that equates happiness with having more and more and more. Consumer goods companies and advertisers will be extremely unhappy about this change. But we will make it because our survival depends on it. We need to make many other changes as well. I only gave three examples. That's why I remain optimistic. We have a choice. We can look ahead to this period of habit change with dread and apprehension, or we can expect that it will be an incredibly exciting time. Never before has a society had a greater need for new technologies, new forms of government, new mechanisms of financial exchange, new insights about the dynamics of cultural change. Never before has there been a time of greater need for the best efforts of the scientists, engineers, managers, and political leaders. This is the 25th year of the Japan Prize. If we look back over the last quarter century, we see the Japan Prize laureates have been incredibly important contributors to our society. 25 years from now, I think we will look back and see that they helped us to change our habits. No one can now honestly say how this transition to sustainability is going to evolve. But I know its principal features will become visible during the lifetime of the people in this room today. There have been long periods of warfare and strife on this island. There have been long periods of peace and prosperity. Now you're entering your third millennium. I believe you'll find ways to make the transition to sustainability with relative peace if you just acknowledge that you must change your habits and learn to live within your limits. Thank you.